Okay, it's time to begin our uh, evening um, period of study and singing and worship. So let's give attention before we do that to uh, these few announcements, which um, uh, are some of them are an update from this morning. Let's uh, uh, first of all say that for our visitors uh, here, you're certainly welcome, and we appreciate your attendance. More than we can say, there's a blue card in front of you. Uh, if you'll drop your name and information on that, leave it on the pew. Somebody will pick that up, and we appreciate you coming. Um, there are a number uh, of folks who are sick uh, at home or sick in hospitals and who are otherwise unavailable to come. Uh, that full list was on the announcement sheet this morning behind me. And let's continue to remember those, please. Uh, three or four items of interest, uh, most significant of which, I, in my judgment, would be one week from today, Sunday morning, uh, the 22nd, begins our gospel meeting with Brother Decker. So let's all make plans, uh, not, not just to be here, but plans in other respects as well uh, for that meeting. A couple announcements with respect to the uh, WKU group, uh, or the college group, uh, and young adult. There's a sign-up sheet in NPR for the Wednesday meals to be prepared for that group. So uh, if you and uh, the folks that you're working with on that have an interest in that, please get your uh, names on that sign-up sheet in the multipurpose room. And then also related to that group, uh, their uh, uh, grub night, which is Tuesday nights, starts at 6 p.m. And uh, this week's will be at the home of the Wilsons. Uh, I trust that's Braden and Michelle. Can somebody do this? Is that right? Braden and Michelle's. Yeah, Braden and Michelle's, 6 p.m. this week. November 5 through 7 uh, is the uh, Southern Kentucky Teen Retreat at Big Reedy. Uh, registration for that, if uh, uh, you have folks that are interested in going to that, is um, due on October the 3rd. Registration forms are on the welcome desk out in the lobby. That retreat is open to middle school and high school students. There's always announcements on the uh, bulletin board. Uh, on the NPR, certain announcements on the website, so we have access to those. Uh, brother Todd Dickerson is doing our closing prayer. And before our good brother Mike leads us in singing, let's uh, pause for a, a, an opening prayer, if we will, please. Bow with me. Righteous and Holy Father, uh, we do pause and uh, lift petitions up to you. And if our time was completely unlimited, and if we had command of all the words at our disposal and all the thoughts that we could pull together were solid and complete, we could spend uh, an eternity saying thank you uh, for every good blessing. Uh, we can't even number of our blessings, Father. One day we think uh, this is a, something that I'm, I'm really blessed to have and other things go unnoticed. Um, certainly, uh, never far from our mind is the great blessing of being in your kingdom. We're so thankful for the great plan of salvation unfolded so clearly and so comprehensively in the Holy Bible from the first page to the last page. Uh, we read of aspects of um, uh, that great plan, and it centers, of course, upon Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, our precious Redeemer. And we thank you uh, for his willingness uh, to leave the comfort of his heavenly environment and come and uh, spend some time with us and spend that time teaching uh, about the kingdom, the kingdom that came with him. We're grateful for his resurrection, Father, which opened the doors uh, for our eternal life. And we pray that you'll help us always be thankful for the church that he established. We're so grateful for the Lehman Avenue congregation and those uh, good men who lead us and have led us in the past. Uh, thankful for uh, Russell and Kevin and John and Bobby, thankful for their families, for their willingness to um, uh, give of uh, these gentlemen's time uh, for the benefit of the spiritual welfare of the whole church. So bless them, Father, with good health and uh, excellent recall of the scriptures that they have so carefully studied. Pray you'll bless our good ministers, uh, Brother Hiram and Brother Neal, Thankful for the great lessons that we've heard even this very day, Father. And we pray that you'll bless these good men uh, with uh, great lives of service, long lives of service in the kingdom. Thank you for sending them both our way. 
Father, so many of our number are sick in one respect or another, and you know the ones that are on our prayers. And we pray, Father, that our prayers won't be confined to somebody standing before us on this uh, pulpit. We pray that we'll each and every one uh, remember these good folks uh, that are struggling with uh, one issue or another issue all the time. Somebody is struggling with something, and some of the struggles are quite severe. So we pray that you'll help us to be on our um, them to be on our minds when we pray to you. Help us to be diligent in that respect, Father. Help us to be uh, willing to help where we can. And please help us to be students of the Word. Help us to be better students and better disciples in the things that we uh, do and say each and every day. Uh, be with us in the uh, exercise of this exercises of this uh, hour in our singing and our study together. And we're thankful that we have an opportunity to do that. Uh, keep us safe in the hall of your hand, Father. Bless those who lead us, uh, not just here spiritually, but in our, um, in our world, our political world. We pray that you'll bless all of those who have responsibility for leading others. And we're thankful for men uh, that, and women that rise up and are willing to do that. And we pray that all of them will have the right focus and the right intentions when they're doing that. Bless us now, Father. Forgive us where we failed you. We do that too often. Help us to be stronger in the faith, maturing every day in the faith more than the days before. Bless us now, we pray, in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. And amen. Our first song this evening is number 527, Paradise Valley. As I travel through life with the trouble and strife, a glorious hope to give cheer on the way. My toil will be o'er and I rest on that shore. For the night has been turned into day. And I'm in the beautiful paradise valley beside the river of my Up in the valley, the wonderful valley, where we dream.
for our lesson this evening, we'll sing number 222. Number 222. If you'd like to mark, if you're using a songbook, we'll sing number 482 as an invitation song. Number 222. Please stand and then stand for the reading of the scripture. <clears throat> Although I cannot see the way for lies to fetch Scripture reading this evening comes from Matthew 22, verses 41 through 46. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. He said to them, How then does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day on did anyone dare question him any more. You may be seated. Good evening. We are grateful for the presence of everyone tonight. Thankful for those that have come back. As has already been mentioned by Roger in the prayer, we heard a great lesson and challenging lesson from Neil this morning, and we appreciate that. And I would speak on behalf of all parents and say we accept the challenge to do what God would have us to do and rear our children up in the teaching and instruction of the Lord. And so we are glad that you're here tonight. And as Neil mentioned this morning, he and I will be tag teaming on these question and answer sessions. I will save all of the difficult ones for Neil, so don't worry about that. But we are looking forward to doing this. You know, questions are a good way to learn. We wouldn't have the parable of the Good Samaritan if someone hadn't asked Jesus a question. And the things about rendering the things to Caesar and loving your neighbor as yourself, all of those great teachings that we love from Scripture come because someone posed the question to Jesus. And so tonight, we hope that the answers that we give will help to clear up some things, shed light on other matters, and help us to dig deeper into Scripture and maybe bring up more questions. There are three that I have prepared on the slides tonight, but receive one more that I think we can get to at the conclusion. So we hope to do four questions. Three of them will be on the screen before you. Question number one. This question concerns Judas, and it is this, and I'm going to break down the question on how it was posed in writing, but the summary of it is before you. If Jesus' crucifixion was a part of the will of God, and it was, then how can it be true at the same time that Judas's betrayal of Jesus was a bad thing? How can Jesus say in places like Matthew 26 and verse 24, it was better for Judas to have never been born if, in fact, his betrayal of Jesus brought on the crucifixion and ultimately accomplished the will of God? And then there's another part of this question that says, if that's the case, if Judas's betrayal of Jesus brought on the will of God, and at the same time Judas is condemned for his unrighteous behavior, what does that say to us about accomplishing the will of God as we try to do the things that please him? When we answer this question, I want us to take a step back and see what the Bible says about the totality briefly of Jesus' coming to this earth and dying for the sins of humanity. 
In Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve violate the will of God and sin enters the world, Genesis 3.15, God says in a prophetic statement that there will come a day when the seed of woman would ultimately crush the head of the serpent, but the seed of woman would have his heel crushed in the process of doing that. And throughout the Old Testament, there are prophecies and windows into what Jesus would ultimately accomplish for the sins of the world. He would be a descendant from Abraham's family line, Genesis 12.1-3. He would be a direct descendant of David that would sit on David's throne, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 16. He would be born in Bethlehem, and one day he would suffer for the sins of humanity through a brutal and horrifying death, Isaiah 53 and Micah 5 and verse 2. But ultimately, he would be raised from the grave, Psalm 16 and verse 10. But as you read the Old Testament, it doesn't just tell us that one day Jesus would die for the sins of the world. It goes into greater detail about how this would transpire. And so, for example, in the book of Psalms, in Psalm 41 and verse 9, the Bible says that it would be one of Jesus' familiar friends that would lift up his heel against Jesus. And then the prophets move us further along. Zechariah says in Zechariah 11 and verse 12 that Jesus or the Messiah would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. And then in the next verse, Zechariah 11 and verse 13, we're told that those pieces of silver would go on to purchase the potter's field. And still the Old Testament says more. The psalmist says that the one that betrays Jesus would die a crucial and horrible death as punishment for his deeds, and another would take his place. Psalm 69 and verse 25, Psalm 109 and verse 8. And so that's the Old Testament picture of Jesus coming to earth, dying for our sins, the betrayal price, and all of the things that would happen to his betrayer. But now let's fast forward to the New Testament. In the New Testament, every time the apostles are listed, they're listed in Matthew 10, verses 1 through 4, Mark 6, and in Luke chapter 6 as well. And every time, without exception, number one, Judas is always mentioned last, and he's never mentioned without this description attached to his name. Judas, the one that betrayed Jesus. Now, when we read those passages about Judas and the betrayal in the New Testament, we should keep this in mind. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote the things that they wrote about Judas after those things had taken place. That's important for us because we need to appreciate that Judas was not defector from the start. In fact, he did everything the other apostles did. When they went out and preached on the limited commission, Judas went out and preached as well. When Luke 6 and verse 12 says that Jesus prayed all night for the apostles, he prayed on that night for Judas as well. When they cast out demons, we have no reason to assume that Judas' demons didn't also come out. In fact, when Jesus tells his disciples on the night of the Passover, in Matthew 26, 20 through 25, one of you will betray me and hand me over to the chief priests and Pharisees to be killed. None of the disciples believe immediately that they know who it is and that it will be Judas. Evidently, Judas looked just like the rest. You might mark this passage off. John's the only one that tells us this. In John 13 and verse 27, John tells us that there was a moment in time when Satan entered Judas. That means something, doesn't it? It means that Satan was not in him before. Up to that point, Satan was not in Judas. But John tells us that there was a moment when he, didn't, when he entered Judas. Of course, Judas allowed it to be so. He agreed to betray Jesus for the 30 pieces of silver. And then later when he felt remorse about that in Matthew 27, 3 through 10... He went back and tried to give the money back. The chief priests and others wouldn't accept it. He went out and hung himself. And then he fell from the hanging, from the noose, you might say, and his bowels bust, burst asunder and he died. Those are the biblical facts about Jesus' death and about Judas' role in it in connection with prophecy. Now let's transition to how this works with the will of God, and then we'll make one more statement about our, our relationship to the will of God. The first thing. We should appreciate this about the will of God in connection with Judas and also in connection with our own lives. God can foreknow things without foreordaining them. God can know that certain things will happen without violating an individual's free will and causing those things to happen. And by the way, you and I can do this same thing on a more limited basis. So a school teacher may say, if you keep not doing your homework, if you continue to get blanks and zeros on assignments, you're going to fail this class. And if Johnny doesn't do his homework, and if he continues to get zeros, he will fail the class. That doesn't make her a prophet. But she could foreknow, or he could foreknow, without foreordaining, without causing those things to be the case. And God does that same thing to a much greater degree. But here's another thing that God can do that we can't do. God can know ahead of time the actions of humanity, even the bad actions of humanity, and then take those actions and use them for his ultimate and his eternal good. 
Job 42 and verse 2 says that nothing can thwart his plans or nothing can change his plans. We should appreciate concerning the betrayal of Jesus at the hand of Judas is about far more of the genius of God than it is the genius of Judas. Judas did not see himself in that moment as God's teammate and moving the scheme of redemption along. What Judas was attempting to do was to align himself with evil men. But God was eternity, and eternity steps ahead of Judas in his plan, and he had already planned to use that for the ultimate good of humanity. God knew that humanity had to have their sins atoned for. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission, Hebrews 9.22. And he knew that when his son came, humanity would not be able to stare long at the righteousness and purity that was Jesus's. And so they would eventually hand him over and betray him and crucify him. But in none of those things was God pleased with the things that would take place to bring about Jesus' Jesus's death. And so when we think about what Judas did, he is not to be applauded for those actions. God is. Because what God is doing in that moment is he's saying to humanity, every time you're at your worst, I'm at my best. And it doesn't really matter what you put into the pot. I'm always able to bring about a masterpiece. And that's what he does with Judas. The lesson for us as we think about the betrayal of Judas is not how smart he was in working with God. It's about the eternal wisdom and foresight of God. As Paul said, the depth and the riches and the knowledge of God, it's unsearchable and beyond our ability to fully comprehend. And that's what he does with Judas' evil, and he turns it around for good. God was not happy with what Judas did, but he used it for good. Luke tells us in Acts 1 and verse 25 that Judas went his own way, or by transgression he fell. I believe it was Martin Luther King who said, right now is always the right time to do the right thing. Someone else has said, it's always right to do right, always wrong to do wrong, never wrong to do right, never right to do wrong. It was not a good thing for Judas to betray and cheat and hand over Jesus. But God turned it, and he used it for his ultimate and for his eternal good. Think about it from your life and mine. God wants us to grow, doesn't he? And sometimes we grow through trials, through difficulty, and through persecution. God uses those things for our growth and our development. But he is never happy or applauding or seeing himself as a teammate and a partner with those who bring about our growth indirectly through their persecution of his people, through their mistreatment, or through their unkindness to us. But yet he uses it for our ultimate good. I was going to use this illustration. It was already written in before these actual events took place tonight. But on our way home, this morning from worship, we were driving and I was a, a car or two ahead of my mom and a car starts driving down the wrong side of the street. And the car in front of me swerved and my mom's car was a car behind mine and this guy, I don't know what happened, but he was on the wrong side of the road and he hit this woman in a head-on collision. That's the truth. Now let's just take that for an aside. I was going to use the example of a drunk driver. I don't know if he was, but he did hit this woman head-on and she was injured pretty badly. Now here's the question. Does God want everybody in the world to be saved? He does, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4, 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. And I don't know the condition of the woman who was in the accident, but suppose she was not a Christian. Suppose she was never interested in the things of God before the accident today. And because of the accident today, she begins to think about the frailty of life. And with sober mind, for the very first time in her life, she realizes that there is a heaven to be gained and a hell to be avoided. And she seeks out the truth and eventually obeys the gospel. Here's the question. Was the will of God accomplished in her life? Absolutely. But the man who hit her and then got out of his vehicle and fled, was he still in the wrong? Is he still to be punished for his wrong deeds? And is he for sure not to be applauded for the wrong that he had done? Absolutely. And so it is with Judas. He did wrong. And God, in his sovereignty and in his wisdom, used it for good. Now, here's the last part of the question. If it is the case that Judas, in helping the will of God to be accomplished, is also called an evil person, and Jesus says in Matthew 26, 24, that it would have been better for him to never have been born, what does this say about you and me and our doing the will of God? Here's what it tells us. We do not have to live from day to day wondering whether or not we're God's friends or merely pawns in God's hands, helping him to accomplish his will. 1 John 5 and verse 3 says, this is the love of God. That we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. We can do the will of God and know that we're doing it. And we don't have to be worried about whether or not God's playing some great trick on us. And we find ourselves in the place of Judas at the end of life's race. That's not true at all. The betrayal of Jesus by Judas should be a great encouragement to every Christian. Because it says this to you and me. That the truth and love of God is so bright that even on earth's darkest night, they can't overdo his plans. 
There are bad things that happen in your life and my life. Sometimes it seems the most terrible things, and maybe those things are true. But the betrayal of Jesus by Judas turned out by God to be one of the very best things. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 8. If the princes of this world had known that what they were doing would bring about the glory that ultimately followed, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. And this event says to you and to me, there are some dark nights in our lives. There are some terrible things that happen. But if we're in Christ, God is too wise and too strong to be dependent upon human beings being on their best behavior in order to accomplish his will. We, they won't thwart his plans. The worst things that have happened in your life and my life, we learn from this event that God is even able to take even those things and bring about good. It's what Tolkien said in his fictional novel, In the End for the Faithful Child of God, Every Sad Thing Will Become Untrue. In Revelation 21, 5, John said, Behold, he's making all things new, and he will. All of the betrayals, all of the mistreatments, Judas is a signpost of what God will ultimately do. It makes passages like Romans 8 and verse 28 sing, and we know that all things work together for good. Not all things are good, but all things do work together for the ultimate good of those that love God and to those that are the called according to his purpose. Satan thought he had Jesus that night, but God proved that he was wrong. And maybe in your life, sometimes it feels that way. But based on these events and others like them, he's wrong about you too. Question number two. There it is. If you've been saved, if you are saved and you lose your salvation, do you need to be rebaptized? The Bible teaches several things simultaneously. Number one, the Bible teaches that if an individual is of accountable age, and he or she is outside of Christ, that individual needs to obey the gospel in order to be saved. And that happens as a person turns to Jesus in faith, believing that he's the Son of God, John 8 and verse 24, repenting of sins, confessing Jesus as the Son of God, and being immersed in water to have their sins, his or her sins forgiven. All of those actions are important, the belief, the repentance, the confession, and yes, the immersion in water. But the New Testament gives special attention to the act of baptism. It's at that point that sins are washed away. It's at that point, 1 Peter 3 and verse 21, that the Bible pronounces an individual saved, and it's from those waters, according to Paul in Romans 6 and verse 4, that one emerges from those waters to walk in the newness of life. We could say about that plan, or what we call the plan of salvation, that that's God's first law of pardon. But just because someone obeys the gospel, and just because they're baptized, they say, well, I'm through with sin, that doesn't mean that sin's through with me, does it? And everybody who's ever obeyed the gospel knows that this is the case. Turn your Bible to Acts 19 briefly. If there is an occasion in the New Testament where some folks were quote unquote rebaptized, this is the only recorded instance of such. When Paul comes to Ephesus in Acts 19, he encounters 12 men. These men, Paul talks with them, and somehow he comes to the knowledge that they haven't been baptized properly. He says to them in verse 2, have you received the Holy Spirit since you've been baptized? They say, we haven't even heard about the Holy Spirit. And then Paul says, well, in verse 3, and to what then were you baptized? And he begins to talk to them about this. And then they realize, we've received John's baptism. Now, John's baptism was for the remission of sins, according to Mark 1 and verse 4. But it was not into the Godhead or into a relationship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit like the Great Commission baptism. And so there are some differences. Evidently, these men received the baptism of John long after it had expired. When Jesus rose from the grave, he ushered in New Testament baptism for the forgiveness of sins. These men had not received that. John's baptism had expired, and so now individuals needed to be baptized into Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and that's exactly what these individuals do. And we could say that they're quote-unquote rebaptized. That's probably not the best way to say it, but if we want to use that terminology, this is the only recorded instance of such. But throughout the New Testament, here's what we do find. If a Christian finds him or herself in sin after having obeyed the gospel, God has a second law of pardon, and it does not involve an individual being rebaptized. In 1 John, turn your Bible to 1 John chapter 1. In 1 John, really the whole book talks about the Christian's relationship to sin. But especially in 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 down through verse 10. Now, even after obeying the gospel, if we deny that we sin or that we have sinned, we make God a liar and we testify that the truth is not in us. That's what John says in verse 8 and also in verse 10. 
But then in verse 7 of 1 John chapter 1, he says, If we walk in the light as Christ is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. And in verse 9, if we confess our sins after having been baptized, we find ourselves enwrapped in sin again. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The child of God who's obeyed the gospel and who has turned away from Jesus Christ can find him or herself back into a saved relationship through confession of those sins, repentance. And a shorthand way of defining repentance would be a change of mind which manifests itself in a change of behavior. And confession of those sins to God and then in prayer. Sometimes a Christian says this. A Christian may say, well... You know, I wish that if, if I could have it my way, right after I get out of the waters of baptism, I would like somebody to just put a bullet in my head right then and there, because then I would know that I could know that I'm going to heaven. But the reality is that's a false statement. The blood of Christ is just as powerful after we've been baptized as it is before and during our baptism. According to John in 1 John 1 and verse 7, we don't lose our salvation every time we sin. We don't fluctuate between lost and damned. As we walk in the light with Jesus Christ, the blood of Christ continues to cleanse us. And when we realize that there's sin in our lives, and even sins of omission, according to 1 John 1 and verse 9, we confess those sins to God in the same blood that purged us clean at baptism is just as effective as we continue to serve Jesus. You are just as clean today if you're a Christian as you were the day you rose from the waters of baptism and no cleaner. Paul says in Colossians 1 and verse 14, in him we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And he echoes that same thought in Ephesians 1 and verse 7. The person that finds himself in sin after having obeyed the gospel needs to turn away from sin confess those sins to God and pray and realize that God is faithful, as John says in 1 John 1 and verse 9, faithful and just. That's another way of John saying God is on the hook to forgive our sins. It's according to his justice. It's what he must do to maintain his integrity in his love and to be consistent with his will. He will forgive us. And we don't have to be rebaptized. We need to rededicate ourselves. One more turning of a passage. Go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 8 on this, and then we'll move into our third question. In Acts chapter 8, there and by the name of Simon the Sorcerer, or Simon the Magician. You can call him a charlatan or AKA the Samaritan Hustler because that's what he was. He performed magic tricks for the people, but when Philip came to Samaria with the gospel, they saw miracles for the first time. In Acts 8 and verse 12, we read that Philip was in Samaria preaching the name of Jesus Christ and the kingdom, and men and women were baptized. In fact, in verse 13, this Simon the Sorcerer, he was baptized as well. And he changed his ways and he obeyed the gospel. In verses 14 through 17, though, we find that individuals had not received the miraculous measure of the Holy Spirit. The only way that could be transferred to an individual was through the laying on of the apostles' hands. Now, in Acts 6, the apostles had laid hands on Philip and the other six men that were with him, but Philip couldn't transfer the power. And so he had to send individuals to Jerusalem to send for Peter and John so they would come down and do the very same thing. When Simon saw how the power was transferred, he was more than awed, he was covetous. And he told the apostles in Acts 8, 18 through 20, give me this power that whosoever I lay my hands on, they'll also receive this same gift. And Peter says to him as he begins to rebuke him, your money perish with you. Your heart's not right in the sight of God. You have neither part nor lot in this matter. Now, Simon had obeyed the gospel. That's what Luke tells us in Acts 8 and verse 13 by inspiration. Some commentators pull away from this, and they count Simon's conversion as insincere. But notice what Peter says to him. He does not say what he said on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized. Look at Acts chapter 8 and notice verse 22. He tells Simon, who is now a Christian, this is God's second law of pardon. This is how you fix it once you're a Christian already and you find yourself in sin. He says, repent and pray that perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For you're in the gall of bitterness and in iniquity. And then in verse 24, Simon requests prayers for himself. He says, pray for me that the things that you've said will not happen to me. If you're a Christian tonight... You will commit sin on occasion. We all stumble. We all do. Though we wish it were otherwise, it's the frailties of humanity in the world in which we live. When you do that, you don't at that moment lose your salvation and become God's enemy. No, in fact, as long as you continue to walk in the light. And you may not have a ready recall of every transgression you've ever committed. John says, Jesus loves you too much to judge you by your worst moment. He will continue to cleanse. As we realize those sins, we do need to confess those things and turn from them. But then in Acts chapter 8, Simon is a case study on how we make ourselves right with God when we've done that. 
When I was a manager at Taco Bell, on occasion, an employee would not be all that he or she should be, and there would be a time to fire an individual or let them go. And this didn't happen often, but sometimes a person would come back and they would say, I've changed. With a new vow of maturity and reformation of life, I'm ready to be a faithful and dedicated taco slinger. You know, they want to come back. They want to be serious. Guac and sour cream. They want to change their ways and amend them. And they vow to show a dependability and a faithfulness that previously was foreign to their work ethic. It didn't always happen, but there were times when we would give an individual another chance. In those moments, we wouldn't say, we need to do the rehiring process over and retrain you. No, they were already in the system. This person didn't need to be retrained and receive the same beginner's information again. They needed a transformation and merely a rededication of life. If you're a Christian, you're already, quote, unquote, in the system. When you obey the gospel and you turn from sins and you walk in the newness of life, if you find yourself in opposition to God, and you can, the New Testament is clear that we can live in such a way as to apostatize. Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, Hebrews 10, 26 through 31, we can live away from God. We can be like that dog who returns to his own vomit. But when we do that, we turn back to God as Jesus tells the church in Revelation 2 and verse 5, repent and do the first works. Return to your first love, Revelation 3 and verse 19. And in that moment, God requires no more of us. He receives us in open arms and welcomes us back into his home. And we don't need to be reimmersed for the forgiveness of sins that Jesus has long forgiven. Here's question number three. What is the difference between deacons and elders and our deacons training to be elders? There are several offices of leadership that are mentioned in the New Testament. For a concise list of those, Ephesians 4 and verse 11 talks about apostles and prophets and pastors who teach and evangelists. And then he even mentions the equipping of the saints in the verses that follow. But the two that we want to talk about tonight are elders and deacons. The Bible talks about Apostle Paul and Barnabas in Acts 14 and verse 23. After they had already established churches throughout the Roman Empire, they went back and appointed elders in every congregation. Even in the church in Jerusalem where the apostles were, in Acts 15 and verse 2, there were elders in the Jerusalem church as well. But the Bible talks about elders in a specific way. If you turn your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 3, go ahead and turn there. In 1 Timothy 3, we read about the qualifications of elders in 1 Timothy 3 verses 1 through 7. Throughout the New Testament, there are several terms used interchangeably to talk about the very same office and the very same group of individuals known as elders. So in Ephesians 4 and verse 11, they're called pastors. In 1 Peter 5 and verse 1, they're called elders. And then in passages like 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1 and Philippians 1 and verse 1, they're called overseers or bishops. But in a passage like 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7 and Titus 1, 5 through 9, there's an exhaustive list of the qualifications that the elders must meet in order to serve in their office. These men are to be individuals that are able to teach, that are hospitable, that have good and upstanding character. The New Testament continues to tell us about their role. They watch for the souls of the members of the congregation over which they shepherd. Hebrews 13 and verse 17. They feed the flock of God. Acts 20 and verse 28. They do all of these things as they possess a delegated authority over the local congregation over which they have the oversight. But then in 1 Timothy chapter 3 verses 8 through 13, we have the qualifications given of individuals known as deacons. Now, the word translated deacon in the New Testament means a servant or a minister. And every Christian is a servant or a minister. But these servants are special individuals that meet special and specific qualifications. They, too, must be godly men who hold the mystery of God with a pure conscience. And they are men that have feet that are swift to service. Deacons are individuals that have been given a charge by the eldership to do a specific task and a specific work in the local congregation. Sometimes, and I guess for ease's sake, people say it this way. The elders are over the spirituals and the deacons are over the physical. And that's a misnomer. Because the deacon's work is equally spiritual if it's done right and assigned in the proper fashion. If a man's job is over the technology or the grounds of the church, the reason why he has that position is in keeping with making the place where we worship conducive to being attractive to outsiders and helping us to worship God in spirit and in truth. It is all spiritual work. It's carried out in the physical, and so is the elders' work, by the way. But each of those offices, the elders and the deacons, are doing spiritual work to and for the glory of God. There are similarities in their qualifications, but there are differences. The deacons are not overseers. 
They serve under the elders that give them the charge to do the work that they are called to do. Some people have said that the seven men selected in Acts 6, 1 through 7, to help with the benevolent controversy in the Jerusalem church mirror the work of deacons, and I believe that's probably right. Those seven men were to have certain qualifications and to discharge those things so that there would be no needy widows or no mistreatment of widows in the church in and around Jerusalem. And deacons in a similar fashion today are selected as their qualified men to serve in the role that the elders give them. There's nothing in the New Testament that says that the deacons are elders in training or that in order to be an elder you must first be a deacon. Think about how this could be problematic. A man may be a great deacon and he may be ruined by being forced into the eldership if he doesn't meet the qualifications or if he's not ready for that role. Furthermore, a man may be readily qualified to serve in the eldership, but if we postpone his appoint appointment because we believe that he must first occupy the office of a deacon, we rob the church of many fruitful years that he could already be serving in that capacity. They're two separate offices. Now sometimes a man who has served as a deacon will later serve as an elder, and that's great. And it may even be the case that we look at a man's work as a deacon, or the lack of work, to say maybe this man would be ready when his time comes if he desires to serve in the eldership, or maybe he wouldn't be because of his inability to exercise the office of a deacon properly. But those things are mutually exclusive. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5 and verse 4 that the elders, when the chief shepherd appears, will receive a crown of life that does not fade away. But appreciate this fact as well. The role of a deacon in the Lord's church is not some junior stepping stone to a higher office. That role and that work has dignity and worth in and of itself whether or not a man ever serves as an elder. 1 Timothy 3.13, Paul says, Those that use the office of a deacon purchase to themselves a great degree of boldness and assurance in the day of Jesus Christ. If you're a deacon, if you've served as a faithful deacon, you didn't miss the mark if you didn't become an elder. When you stand before Jesus having served in that capacity to the best of your ability, he will be pleased and say, well done with the work that you've done. And likewise, a man who served in the eldership and office and served in the way that he should, God will be pleased with his work as well. The elders and deacons work together. The elders have the oversight over the local congregation, and deacons do special work. In Philippians 1 and verse 1, Paul says in a sum summary statement about the church at Philippi, to the elders, the deacons, and all the saints. And that's the way God has organized the New Testament church. Now, those are the three questions that we were set to deal with. And there is one more that we'll deal with briefly tonight before we extend the Lord's invitation. This was one that we received right before the services tonight. And it's about the wearing of crosses. Is it scriptural? Is it biblical for individuals to wear crosses and things of that nature around their neck or maybe on a ring or something like that? And this has been called in religious circles iconography, where the Catholics sort of have images and things like that. And maybe this makes individuals shy away from doing those things, but there's nothing in the Bible that condemns such. What the Bible says about your dress and mine is that it must be modest. It must not draw attention to ourselves or be a stumbling block to others, but wearing something like a cross and a religious symbol or as a reference to our our service to God and our worship and love for Jesus Christ, there's nothing in the Bible that condemns such. We can do those things to the glory of God. We can do it without drawing attention to ourselves. And we can do it without it being associated with something that we may think is unscriptural or ungodly. If it's a stumbling block for us, maybe we should refrain. But we don't have God's authority to make laws for other people or to say that it's unscriptural or sinful to do so. You've been kind to listen tonight. I appreciate the questions that we've been able to study, and I look forward to the future question and answer sessions that we can have together. The greatest question that's ever been posed is, what must I do in order to be saved? It's what the Philippian jailer posed in Acts chapter 16, and Paul told him to believe on the Lord Jesus, he and his house, and he would be saved. He washed their stripes and his penitence, and then he was baptized, he and his whole household. And in that moment, his sins were forgiven. Maybe somebody needs to do that tonight. Maybe you're a Christian already. You've already obeyed the gospel and you need the prayers of the church. We'd be happy to pray with you and pray for you. I hope in summary from the questions that we've seen tonight, we walk away with this reality. It really doesn't matter in what capacity or office we serve. We can be faithful servants and have God's approval. We will on occasion stumble and mess up, but God is not a cop in the sky waiting for us to stumble so that he can buzz us down to hell. He is rooting for us. He's on our side. He wants to cleanse us. He wants to forgive us. And all of the evil that this world can muster. We look at occasions like the betrayal with Judas, and we are assured of this one reality. God is ten steps ahead of the devil, and he has our ultimate good and victory in mind. 
If we can help you tonight, come now as together we stand and as we sing. simple song, you'll probably know it anyway. Uh, the Lord's Supper has been prepared for those who have not had the opportunity to take of it. It'll be, if you'll exit now in the room to your left, it'll be, I think, probably in the office. But someone will direct you. Okay, uh, room three. Room three, correction on that. The reason why I want to sing this song is I never get to, this is a song you have to sing at night. You can't sing it during the day. It's one of my favorite songs, and I never get to lead this song. So it's nighttime. Jeremy asked me to lead. I'm going to lead this song. Okay. okay. We'll sing the first and the last verse. I like I say, I think you'll be familiar with the song even without the book. Now the day. Pray, Father, that all that, it, that we have done here today has all been in accordance to your word. We're thankful, Father, for the men that are ministers here at this congregation. We're so thankful for them, Father, and their families. We're thankful, Father, that you sent them our way. Again, we're thankful, Father, for the men that serve here as elders and deacons, deacons also. We're thankful, Father, for the work that they do. 
We're especially thankful, Father, for Jesus Christ. We're thankful, Father, that Jesus took our sins to the cross. We're thankful, Father, that he went to the cross for us and then rose again. We pray, Father, that each day we might strive harder to, to be as Jesus. We pray, Father, that you would uh, go with us throughout this week and protect us and keep us safe. And we pray, Father, that uh, you would bring us back again at the next appointed hour. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.